and said, I know that you're horrible, but I know what kind of God I serve. I have a It says, soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain. A large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. And the young man who had died was a widow's only son. And a large crowd from the village was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it. And the bearer stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Great fear swept the crowd, and they praised God, saying, A mighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people today. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. Look again at verse 12, just for a simple portion of clarity. It says, A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died, what is, was a widow's only son. Once again, for this third installment of the series, I want to talk from this thought there is life after all hope is gone. Lord, speak. Your people need to hear. What happens when the worst thing that you could possibly imagine comes true? That, that really is the point of this woman in our text. She's a widow, which means that she's experienced loss before. Her husband has died, and we're not given any reason. All we know is that she has no husband. And in those days, uh, most of their prominence and position was based upon their connection to marriage through a man. But she has no husband, so she's a widow. We're not certain about how he died, but there was still a glimmer of hope in her life. She had a son. The son would grow up and continue the name of the family and provide legacy, but even deeper than that, for this woman... You can imagine what a tremendous relationship she must have had with her son. As she nurtured, as she invested, raised this boy up. You can imagine the time that they shared together in this little town called Nain. But somehow, some way, we're not given even greater insight. All we know is that all of a sudden, her dreams had shattered. We're not told if there was a prolonged sickness. We were not even told if there was something tragic that occurred, all we know when we are introduced to this woman in our text in Luke chapter 7, is she now finds herself in the funeral procession of her dead son. You can imagine that when this time came for a woman who's experienced loss, now a lost husband and now a lost son, this was the, most, this was the worst thing that she could ever imagine to take place in her life. And I can imagine as it comes for anyone to consider Burying a loved one, I mean, for one, the husband, even though it perhaps was hard, losing a child was even more challenging. Any parent will tell you to lose their child is perhaps the worst thing that you can feel. Most parents say they want their children to bury them. They don't want to bury their children. And now she's forced to come to this moment, and she has to take all the arrangements to now make sure that her dead son is properly disposed of. Because of the custom of that day, this is what they would do with the bodies. They would wrap them in a shroud, and because you could not bury bodies within the limits of the town, they would have to take the dead body to the tombs right outside the gate of the city. And that's what we see in this text is this widow. She's leading the funeral procession. Behind her, being carried on the shoulders of Paul Bearers, is her deceased and dead son. If you can imagine that she's dressed in this grief garb as you see her veiled and perhaps tears cascading down her face the wails that are coming from her soul because of the intensity of the grief and every step she takes is taking her closer to this gate the gate is the last boundary they would have to cross before her son would be buried this would be the last few steps she would be taking with the body of her son and can you imagine that each step she takes is taking her closer into a deeper form of despair I can imagine as she counts them, she had never counted them before. Before, when she would make her way to the gate, it was never for this reason. This time, the gate signified something deeper. It was the place where all the hope would be gone. Her son is dead, and she's walking. She's in pain. I can imagine the weight of the moment is perhaps weakening her knees. And as she steadies herself and tries to push through, 
I can imagine in her mind she's thinking about what tomorrow will hold. This next normal where she's by herself trying to figure out what she must do to make ends meet. Being a widow at this point with no child meant that now she would have to rest upon the generosity of others. It is shown in the text that she's known she has friends, but in this moment of grief, there is nothing more than isolation. Even though a crowd is with her, she feels all by herself. And right there behind her is her dead son. Son now that she'll never see again. The son now that will never experience a future together. Son now, she starts to think about everything she will not be able to experience. She will not be able to attend uh, her son's wedding. She will not be able to attend uh, perhaps his matriculation through the name school uh, of whatever. Now she's thinking about a future that will no longer come to pass. Every step is a reminder of how hopeless she is. And as she gets closer to the gate, as she makes her way to this moment, the text says something strange occurs. That as she gets to the gate, right outside of the gates are the tombs for which they will bury her son. The text says there is a, a crowd coming in while they are going out. And as she is leading the processional of her dead son, wouldn't you know it that the one that's leading the processional coming in is Jesus. This chance encounter, this unexpected moment happens. And as she's sitting there going about the business of the funeral procession, she meets Jesus. And after this chance meeting with Jesus, a meeting with Jesus that was unexpected, Jesus does something so powerful that even though she had given up on anything else going forward, she had not even asked about her own son being resurrected in her mind. This was it. All hope was done and dashed. She was preparing to say her final goodbyes and put him in the tomb. But when she met Jesus at the gate, at the last physical place of any change taking place, the text says that Jesus does something for her she did not even ask for. That in this moment, the thing she had given up on, the promise that she thought she would never experience, by the time this interaction ends, this widowed woman from Nain who was in the middle of a funeral procession with her dead son is now taking her live son home. All because when all the hope was gone, the one that represents hope, Jesus, stepped in and turned her situation around. And my brothers and sisters, that oftentimes is what got me as I I consider the, the power of this text is that for many of us, uh, if we're to experience the true hope of God, uh, it is found in the processionals uh, of hopelessness. While uh, we are parading towards uh, the gate of misery, what if I told you that at the gate of misery, you can meet the master named Jesus? What if I told you? That those things that you have given up on, that somehow, someway, in an unexpected, unprompted way, Jesus can show up and Jesus can show up. I know that it was hard and I know you have cried and I know that you're thinking to yourself that no good thing will come out of this. You have prepared yourself for a funeral without that thing that is behind you. You have already given up on it. You have thought that it is over only to have Jesus show up at the last moment and make a last impact in your life somebody can testify that that's where I met Jesus I didn't meet him in Sunday school no I didn't meet him on tab global but I met him at the gate of hopelessness I met him when I thought all things were over and that's when Jesus showed up and turned it around for my good and that's what we see in our text is with a woman of name who is leading the funeral procession of her dead son meets Jesus and even though this chance meeting with Jesus was not something she had asked for Jesus did something that she did not even think was possible Jesus turned a funeral into a celebration and isn't it amazing how when Jesus shows up he can turn our low moments into high moments Jesus can turn our funerals into celebrations and I need someone to know that I know that you've given up on and I know that you're preparing to say ashes to ashes and dust to dust to it. I know uh, that that dead situation uh, that you don't even have given consideration for, I want you to know Jesus can still turn it around. 
D.L. Moody, that great biblical theologian, says that he searched all the four Gospels looking for a funeral sermon of Jesus and has never found one. Yet Jeremiah Wright, that famed pastor from Chicago, says that Jesus doesn't do funerals. He does resurrections. And this is my simple premise because I need someone to receive this revelation. I want you to know that thing which you have given up on, God can still raise it. That thing that you thought was never going to come to pass, God can still raise it. And here's the powerful thing. It ain't even got to be stuff that you prayed about or have prayed for. Because sometimes when the Lord shows up, he just has to make a difference in our lives. And that's what this text begins to empower you and I. Because it gives you and I the hope of this one simple fact that there is life after all the hope is gone. And I need you to know that when you have counted it out, when you are close to the 10 count of that situation, God can still show up and shift it and restore to you that which you have given up on. That's the power of this text for me. And as we begin to put it within the context of not only what's happening in this widow of Nain's life, but let's put it in the context of our lives. What have you given up on? What has died that you have not even considered the possibility of life ever returning? What is it that you are in the funeral procession of that perhaps God wants to restore? What is it? that you have even taken out of your mind, you have checked it off of your list as ever coming to pass, and perhaps you, like this widow of Nain, have come to the point of desperation and hopelessness, and I'm here to tell you, uh, God can still raise it. And that's what takes place in this passage. And I'm not sure who needs to hear this word, but I want you to know, even though you may give up on it, don't give up on God. Because there's something powerful that God can do in these moments of hopelessness that by Jesus showing up in this moment for this widow of name shows you and I the wonderful picture of how Jesus personifies restored hope. And this restorative hope is littered throughout this text. By the time Jesus does what Jesus does, the crowd is so in awe and reverent because they came to mourn and Jesus turned it into rejoicing. And I believe that that kind of Turnaround can happen, but there's a process that it must take place. When hope meets our hopelessness, when Jesus meets our funeral processions, there's some things that text seems to convey in order for us to see how this miracle gets transpired. There, there are some things that, that I really was drawn to in this passage because when Jesus shows up on the scene, it's interesting to note how it occurs in this widow of Nain's life. The first occurrence that I see how we see this interruption, if you will, by restorative hope personified in Jesus. The first thing we realize is that when hope shows up in our hopeless situation, it greets us with an unanticipated expression of compassion. That this is powerful. When you think about it this way, what I'm suggesting is that this widow was not looking for Jesus. But even though she wasn't looking for Jesus, she still was found by Jesus. That that's why the story of Luke is important. That the, this town of Nain, which is only a few miles outside of the home area of Jesus, is only mentioned this one time in Scripture. Now, understand that even though not much is known about Nain, it doesn't have the prominence of prestige, we get some insight that this widow of Nain, who most of us would have never have known except her being in this situation, was headed to the tombs outside the city of Nain. She was headed to bury her son when all of a sudden Jesus comes through. We're not even told why Jesus would make this pit stop. And I know there'll be many others who are far smarter than me that would perhaps try to use this route that Jesus was taking as perhaps some shortcut to his next thing. Matter of fact, this miracle of the raising of the widow's son happens between the raising of the Roman centurion's officer and this discussion that Jesus will have with the disciples of John the Baptist. This seemingly obscure moment happens on the fringes of what many would argue is perhaps the larger span 
of the deed and the will of the ministry of Jesus. But in this moment, it just so happened that when he's coming through Nain, the widow is heading out. But what gets me in the text is remember she's in a funeral procession. She's dressed in grief garb, veiled in black. You can imagine that this was a time of thing. She's only focused on getting past the gate to the tombs. But the text says that while these two crowds are getting ready to cross, something powerful happens. Note, the widow does not see Jesus. We have no indication that she's even paying attention to everything around her. Her mind is focused on getting to the gate and then the tombs to bury her son. But in that moment, while she is focused on the next thing to bury her son, the text says something powerful, and Jesus sees her. Her, her mind is focused on the tomb. The gate signifies the last possible time she will see her son. And so she's concentrated on this hopeless moment, this despairing season. And yet, while she's grieving, Jesus sees her. And that's powerful to you and I because I will admit that this one little nugget, this one little textual fact of the text is what perhaps gave me an amazing moment of hope because I will admit I am glad I have a God that sees me even when I'm not paying attention and even when I'm at my worst. This woman is grieving. She is dressed in the garb of grief. She is headed towards the tomb to bury her son. This is not her best day. This is not her best moment. I can imagine that she probably didn't think about anything else but the enormous of the moment she was weighed down in sorrow but even in her sorrow Jesus still sees her this term sees does not mean just to look at or to glance at it means to intently survey it it means that Jesus saw this woman just as she was and I must admit to you that that was good shouting material for me because I know there are some of us who want to be seen but we want to be seen at our best. We want to be seen with the best photos we post on Instagram. We want to be seen in the best view of life. We want to make sure that when we are seen that people see our good qualities and our good attributes. But at our worst in the text, this widow is at the point of despair. But even when other peoples would have overlooked her, Jesus still saw her. And that's good news for someone today that's been through a tough time, a hard period, that's been struggling, that's had to endure grief, that did not know what tomorrow holds. You didn't feel like getting out of the bed and there were people that avoided you because sometimes people only want to be around you when things are going well. But I'm glad that you and I are being reinforced through this text to know that even on our bad days, even on our rough moments, even when things are not going well, we got a God that sees us just where we are. He doesn't just see us when we're on the mountaintop but we're in the valley of pain. When we're in the valley of turmoil and tragedy the text is clear. Jesus still sees us. And that's, that's good news for you and I because I, I'm grateful to know that God sees me. He sees me for all I have, whether it's a good day or a bad day. He sees me when things are, are not going well. He sees me in the throes of grief. He sees me when my heart is broke. He sees me when my mind is going crazy. He sees me in the midst of my confusion. He sees me in the midst of my questions. Here's the good news, uh, that it doesn't matter your state. Jesus can still see you. The text is clear that Jesus sees her. He he surveys where she is. He sees her status. And then this, this expression that was unanticipated of, of compassion is not only that Jesus sees her, but then Jesus speaks to her. He tells her in this text, do not cry. Now, now I, know, I know on the surface reading this from our English perspective, you're asking the critical question that I too had to ask. What's compassionate about Jesus telling her not to cry? As someone who's pastored close to 20 years, I've seen people at their best and at their worst. 
I know the tendency and the weight of trauma and tragedy. I know as I've been around people who've had to bury loved ones and have had dreams dashed, I would tell you that they would teach you in moments like this of congregational care to don't tell people not to cry. There's something therapeutic about tears. And so when I initially read this, my thinking was, Jesus, that, that doesn't seem right. Why didn't you treat her like you treated a Mary at the tomb of Lazarus? And when she cried, you wept with her. But until I began to understand that when he tells her don't cry, you have to understand and unpack the different layers of a text. I hope many of you who listen to me preach understand that you got to take the text in its context in order to do the hard work of exegesis. So when Jesus in this text tells her not to cry, he's not telling her not to make tears. He's telling her not to yell with grief. In those days that there was a performative nature to grieving. That, that, that grief, depending upon the depths of it, is that many would yell out, the louder you yelled, the more perfunctory your grief was meant to be. The more that person meant to you, the louder you would yell out. So in this text, when Jesus says, do not cry, he's not saying, do not allow tears to come. He was saying, Cease in the perfunctory expression of your grief. That in this moment, I need you to stop yelling because I need you to understand I'm about to make a change. But I need you in a perfunctory way to cease grieving because by yelling and grieving this way, you're going to miss what I'm about to do. So what I need you to do is I need you to to embrace the posture to cease weeping in order to experience my next move. And my brothers and sisters, that thing pushed me a little harder because what Jesus was saying is, I'm not saying don't cry. What I'm saying is don't yell out loud. That in this moment, I need you to make sure that you can experience the fullness of what I'm about to do, but I don't need you to wait until it's done to change your disposition. I need you, before I do my work, to already in a perfunctory way look like you know something's about to happen. This is important because he sees her and speaks to her. That this hope in this moment provided compassion. And I want someone to know that we serve a Savior that is compassionate to us in our tough moments. He understood based upon where she was, what she had lost. But yet he wanted her to understand that what I'm about to do, I need you to embrace and receive even before I do it. That's why this text is powerful. In this chance, unexpected, and unprompted meeting, Jesus expresses this moment of compassion. But then also note what he does is that when hope meets this widow woman, we also see in the text that, that hope grounds us in an unforeseeable expression of comfort. Because Jesus didn't just give her compassion, he provides comfort. And the comfort he provides is by touching the coffin and speaking to the dead son. Now, now I know, I know, I know, I know, when you think about this, Understand in those days, when he says coffin, it's not talking about some wooden box. In those days, they would not bury people in wooden boxes. The coffin that they would talk about is the layer of shroud that would be encasing the body of the deceased. But the body of the deceased would be carried on the shoulders of what would be considered our pallbearers. But see, you got to understand Grief in those days was perfunctory on a lot of levels. Not only were the grieving supposed to wail and weep as an outward expression of the intensity of their grief, but part of the funeral package, if you will, was that you would pay people to do certain things. You would pay people to mourn while you grieve, but you would also pay people to carry the deceased body. It's not like what we would do now when we would get family and friends of the deceased to carry the dead body. No, in that day, you had to pay them to carry the body. Why? 
Because to touch anything that touched something dead meant you were ritually unclean. So you would have to pay people to take on the burden of uncleanliness in order to transport your deceased one to the tombs. So those who were carrying the body of her dead son were not necessarily friends, but they were paid people whose sole job was to take your deceased thing to the tombs. But watch what Jesus does. As they were progressing towards the tomb, Jesus touched the coffin, the body of the dead son. This touching of Jesus stops them in their tracks. Now, now I know we could, we could spend all day theologically trying to unpack this notion of Jesus touching the coffin, which in essence, he's touching something that should make him ritually unclean. But the real point of the passage is not that for me, but what got me is a response to Jesus' touch. The text says that as soon as Jesus touched the coffin, those supporting the dead body stopped. Now remember, she is headed towards the gate. Outside the gate of the city would be the tombs where the dead son would be buried. Each step was a progression towards the soon. But when Jesus touches the coffin, the processional stops. Which means that Jesus, by this one touch, stops the progression of her pain. Because every step would take them closer to the gate, which was closer to the tombs. And by, in essence, them stopping meant that there would be no longer a processional or a parade towards the tomb. Which means that in that moment, Jesus' touch was now going to be a cessation of the progress of her pain. Y'all got to hear what I'm saying. That when Jesus touches this coffin, touches this dead son and the processional stops it gives us the literal picture of through one touch of Jesus he can stop the progression of our pain in other words before it gets better it won't get worse in other words before the miracle is manifested Jesus puts a stop to what continually could be the degradation of the pain of the life of this widow by stopping the procession he was stopping the progression of her pain I need someone to receive what I just said because here's what Jesus told me as he gave me a text of revelation he said goody this is what I do oftentimes before I turn it around I just make sure things don't get worse which means that I know it hurts but it ain't gonna hurt worse than this I know it's gonna be painful but it ain't gonna be more painful than this and sometimes you ought to thank God that we serve a God that stops the progression of our pain. It hurts, but this is the worst it's going to feel. It's painful, but this is the most painful it's going to feel. It's hard, but this is the hardest it's going to be. I'm glad I serve a Jesus that stops the progression of my procession. Touches it. But then, watch what he does. He speaks to the dead son. He says, young man, I say to you, arise. Now, now, notice the imagery of the storm. The processional has stopped. Everyone's eyes are on Jesus. And Jesus speaks to the dead son. Now, to those in the crowd, there are many who probably joined. They probably knew who the son was. But no one had as intimate a relationship with the son like the widow. For the widow, this dead son represented a cessation of any formative future. By her son dying, it meant that no longer could she rest upon that legacy of the family continuing. This dead son was everything to this widow. And through his death, it meant no future, no prosperity, no joy to be found. 
that that is what is embodied in the dead carcass of her son. But watch what Jesus does. Not only did he see the widow and tell her not to cry, he starts to speak to that which is causing her pain. He speaks to the dead son. Now, I need someone to receive this because really it shows a wonderful picture how oftentimes in order to get us better, Jesus not only speaks to us, he speaks to it. That Jesus has the most incredible way of speaking to the very situation that you have given up on. In other words, what we see in the text is a thing that had died is what gets to hear the word of the law. In other words, that's why sometimes, my brothers and sisters, uh, it's not only what we hear that makes the difference, uh, but it's what that which is our situation, that which is our dream, that which is our desire, that which can be refined uh, is what the Lord speaks to, which means uh, that Jesus understood that it may seem dead to you, but through my very word, there's still some life uh, in it, which means that oftentimes I pray to God, in uh, be God, speak to me. But our prayer to God ought to be speak to it. God, speak to the relationship that I've given up on. Speak to the job situation that I've given up on. Speak to the community that seemingly continues to turn its back on disenfranchised and marginalized people. You speak to it because I tried and I've given up on it. But I'm grateful to report that there's something to be said because God always has the final say. Even as we stand in the throes of what is one of the most most tenuous seasons uh, of the history of this country. There are times uh, when I too, like you, uh, have given up on some stuff, but I said, you know what? Uh, I'm going to let you speak to it. I'm going to let you speak to chambers of government. I'm going to let you speak to stuff that they don't think could ever work again because there's something powerful, not when you speak to it, uh, but when the Lord speaks to a young man. I. This whole indication of I when Jesus says it, literally means that it is through the authority of Jesus that he is able to speak to something that does not seem like it has a chance to even recover and through his words begin the process of resurrection. I need you to know that what we see in this text by Jesus touching the coffin, speaking to the young man, shows us how God shows us this unforeseeable expression of comfort. And not only do we see compassion in this text about what he did with the widow, not only do we see comfort in this text, what he does with the dead son, but here in the passage also gives us this third and final thing that happens when restorative hope meets us on our hopeless journey is that it also lets us know that hope gives us with the undeniable expression of charity. Because sex says that after Jesus speaks to the dead man, the text says, the boy gets up and starts speaking. Now, you got to imagine <laughs> what a sight this had to be for everyone there. The widow, the crowds. Remember, there's two crowds, one that was with Jesus and one that was with the widow of name, one that was in a somber mode and the other that was in a celebratory mode. Jesus stops the processional, touch the coffin, speaks to the young man, and the next thing that happens, the young man sits up and start speaking. Now, now I can imagine, for one, the sitting up was not the most profound action of this dead body. You can imagine during that time, they were literally, because they don't have our embalming processes, I can make the argument that most of them were perhaps not found it unusual for dead bodies to move. It's what is called uh, uh, when, when, when you see them go in, into spasms after death, when the muscles get it. It's what we call rigor mortis. So for there to be some action of a dead body perhaps was not as alarming to those in the crowd. Why? Because that's just what happens. You can be lifeless and still move. But what clarifies and brings the truth of what Jesus did is not just that the young man got up. What clarifies the totality of the miracle is that while the man, young man got up, he started talking. Now, why is that significant? Because you can't be lifeless and not speak. I wish I had time. See, see that's why oftentimes in church, 
we encourage you to open your mouth because lifeless things can move, but things that are truly alive can speak. And so here in the text, when the boy gets up, what confirms the work of Jesus is not that he's moved from his dead position, but he begins to speak. He becomes mentally functioning. He begins to auditory, begin to have a conversation. Now, we're not told what the young man says, but I can imagine he started talking in a way that began to bring reassurance to the widow by talking, by articulating. It meant that he was now dead, but now he's fully alive. See, uh, it's one thing if Jesus would have brought him back uh, and he would have been alive but not functioning it would have caused uh, a little more complaining uh, or pain in the life of the widow I mean I'm grateful to have it back Jesus uh, but now I've got to care for it it's not as it was before but when Jesus resurrects the young man uh, he doesn't just resurrect him he restores him by the mere fact that the young man is talking means uh, he's got his full mental capacity uh, which means he's better than he was, uh, than he just is. In other words, he's in the same state he was uh, before he died. Uh, I love that because I'm grateful that when Jesus shows up, uh, he doesn't just turn things around uh, just to turn them around, but here he shows us uh, that resurrection also brings about restoration uh, because once the young man started talking, it confirms uh, the work that Jesus had done uh, and the final thing Jesus would do uh, is the text says, and the man is given back to his mother. This meant that what she had given up on, what was incomplete in her life, what was a void, was now returned back to her in totality and it was only done through the work of Jesus. I wish I had time because I would tell you that's what the Lord does is that he's able not to just give it back to you but give it back to you in a restored state so that you're not missing a beat and that which you have given up on, God can still give it back. I'm done. May the Lord bless you real good. But somebody needs to know that's the kind of God we serve. That she started out on a funeral, but ended up with a celebration. Can y'all roll back with me to the house of the widow of Nain? Because I can imagine now things were a little different. When she left the house that morning, she was prepared for a funeral. She had looked in her son's room one last time and thought that would be the final time he laid on that bed. The final time he would spend time in that room. The final time he would sit at the dining room table and tell me about his day. When she started out that morning she thought that it would end with him buried in the tomb. But by the time the sun set and by the time the day had closed, she now was back in her house. But this time she was not crying but she was celebrating the son she had given up on that she thought would never come home that would be ended up in the tombs was now having them back with her in the house and they were celebrating and rejoicing and I started to think what would happen if I was a fly on the wall what would I ask and what would I want to hear that this widow had to say she probably looked at her son and says, son, I had given up on you, but then Jesus came along. There's nobody like Jesus. Won't he do it? Won't he turn things around? That's the testimony of the widow, that there's a life after all hope is gone. That what she had given up on, God restored back to her. This past week, as we prepare our hearts to think about a good friend of our church, a man that I licensed ministry, Cedric Thomas, for the last couple of weeks had a pressing issue with his family. His son, his oldest son, who was born with a heart defect, he would keep texting me. They were posting on social media. It finally came to the point where they said that the Heart defect that finally come, it wore his heart out to the point that there was nothing else they could do. I never get frantic to get in a text in the morning, said, hit me up and said, man, it's not looking good. Valve is messed up and 
This might be it. We're praying, but it ain't really looking good. I, I want y'all to lift us in prayer. I said, we got you. We're praying for a little said as well. He said, man, I, I just don't know. You know, the process for this is hard. Matter of fact, they had to resuscitate him a couple times. There was a couple times they said, we're not even sure if he's living off of the machines. He said, just pray, PG. I said, cool, we got you. And as a father, I know how much it was for him, and I know how hard this was for the family. But he, as a father and also as a preacher, he had to start thinking to his mind, what happens if it doesn't work out? Lo and behold, one particular time after we prayed, I got another text message saying, PG, you wouldn't believe what happened. We know we needed a heart transplant, and typically heart transplants take months, sometimes even years. But it said, PG, we got word today that after just a few days, they said they found him a heart. And this is going to be such a tremendous surgery that what he had been struggling with the majority of his life, with this new transplant, it's going to make him even better than he was before. As I said, what you mean? He said, man, Pastor, we've always knew because of this heart defect that there may come this time. It may be affecting his way of life, this kind of thing. But now, something that we had resigned in our hearts that perhaps this was just going to be what it is. Perhaps this is God's will. We now got this absolute new lease on life. And Young said, said strong, is getting a new heart. He said, matter of fact, we're going to be coming home in a few days after spending some weeks in the ICU. And that thing spoke to me, especially as I began to read this particular passage and think about this. For this woman to be on the brink of despair and have the Lord turn it around, she knew like no one else could know, it was nobody but the Lord. I don't believe the widow of Nain, neither do I believe said, but I believe there's others. I don't know what you have given up on. I don't know what dead situation you are committing yourself to burying that the Lord can still raise up. And this is all I want you to know. Before you say ashes to ashes and dust to dust, Here's the crazy thing. He can step right in, right then, right at the final portion, right at the last moment, and raise it. And not only raise it, but restore it to like it was before. That, that's the real point of this passage, is that here she was at a place where all hope seemed to be gone and still experience life after that. And for you and I, that's good news, and that's a good place for us to praise God. The text concludes this way, and I'm done when I give you this, that when the crowd saw it, they were in awe and started rejoicing. That in this moment, there were many who had joined the processional for a funeral, not realizing that there wasn't going to be a funeral that day. Isn't it amazing how God can change things just that fast? Listen, I want to give you an important opportunity that is to partner. Your life can change just like that. I'm not saying when you join a church, but when you partner with Jesus Christ, things can change. And here's the crazy thing. This miracle this widow got, she didn't even ask for. And part of the things that I've really been asking God is, God, I want you to do things that I don't even know I need you to do. I want you to provide life in spaces and areas and circumstances that I didn't even think was even possible anymore. He can do it without you even asking for it. Can you receive a miracle that you didn't even pray for? <laughs> a couple ways you see on the screen for you to join. Text that word join to the number there. Also email us at... Connect with us at tbcaugusta.org or even go to our website. But even more practically, right there in the comments section, our tab, our team is ready to engage with you. If this word blessed you, if this word spoke to you, 
let us know. If there's things that you have given up on that you are preparing to bury, I want you to know he can still show up and show out. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, this word really resonated in my heart and I've dealt with it. There's some things that have died that I've just moved on with. But I want you to know that he is able to turn some things around. Maybe you say, listen, I really want to talk to somebody. We have some incredible people, some amazing prayer warriors right there in our live Connect Zoom room. And they would love to talk with you and pray with you. I'm always blessed by the testimonies I get week in and week out from people who have called in and tuned in from across the globe that have been changed and challenged and transformed based upon what they experienced through our worship. So I want to give you that opportunity. I want you to know there is life after all hope is gone. Listen, I love you guys. May God continue to keep you. It's my prayer. And I want you to know that because we've been blessed, we're going to be a blessing. Take care and may the God of peace continue to strengthen you in all you do. That is my prayer. Amen. Was that not a great word? That's our third installment of Pastor Sermon Series, It Can Live Again, giving us great hope that some that once were dead can still live. So this sermon series is blessing my entire life, my entire spirit, especially after 2020 and now we in 2021 and things are still a little shaky. So this sermon is giving me much life. I am excited that you were here and we pray that you were blessed by this word and by the worship experience. Please make sure you share, make sure you, you know, add us in on our social media platforms and follow us and subscribe to us on YouTube because we want to make sure that you all learn of all the great things that we're doing. Pastor has alerted you to many things that are coming up, amen, and we're excited about Resurrection Sunday. We also are in the midst of a financial lit and fast, so please make sure that you're watching them coins, watching that pocket, amen, and doing things unto the Lord with your fast because at the end of the day, we want to hold everything to submission to the Lord. Again, we are excited that you were here and we pray that you were blessed and we pray that you have a great and awesome blessed week. With that said, Tat, we love you. We're blessed to be a blessing. Peace.